Hello and welcome to this episode of the Offspring Magazine podcast. I'm Yuli and I will be hosting this episode. Today you will listen to my conversation with Tarek Hassan. Tarek is a postdoc at CMAT, the Center for Energy, Environmental and Technological Research in Madrid. He and his colleagues used telescopes that were originally built to measure gamma rays to observe visible light from stars. With a technique called stellar intensity interferometry, they can measure the shapes and sizes of stars with a high precision. To advance this research last year, he was awarded an ERC grant. Tarek talks about why these measurements are important and explains how interferometry works and what the future applications might be. So stick around and enjoy this episode. Welcome, Tarek. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining this podcast, taking the time out of a very stressful day. <laughs> yes, yes. Too many people want to see me. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe we can start by you telling us a little bit about who you are, what you usually do, and why you are here today in Munich. Yes, so, um, so hello, world. I'm Tarek, Tarek Hassan. Um, so I'm currently a postdoc in Madrid. So, so I spent some years in, in Berlin, in, at DESI, uh, but now I'm back in Madrid and uh, I'm here because we have a meeting in the Magic Collaboration, uh, the working group that is actually working in optical interferometry, which is the field that I'm working on mainly lately. Yeah. So maybe for full disclosure for our listeners, we know each other because <laughs> we are both members of the Magic Collaboration. Um, I think we will cover the magic telescopes later on in the conversation, what they are, how they yes. work. Um, yeah, and yes, you are you're part of this the special group, the outsiders somehow yes, in the collaboration. Yes, yes. So it's a telescope clearly that, that was designed to do very high energy gamma ray astronomy. And we're doing something completely different, which is optical interferometry, which is something super hard to understand, which I will make a great effort. To yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, just to make it a bit easier yeah, to understand. Because yes. I have listened to some of your talks or like talks of the group and I still don't really get it how yeah. it works. So I apologize. Um, it's, it's, <laughs> I interferometry is, is very nice, yeah. but super hard to understand. Yeah. So it's, it's, yeah. Our bad. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe let's start with, um, yeah, you're talking, you're saying optical interferometry and you're focusing on stellar interferometry. That's what you always call it, right? So you're, mm -hmm. you're observing stars. Yes. So what exactly do you achieve with these observations? What do you look at with the, of the stars? Perfect. So, so, um, so, yeah. So, this interferometry technique is generally used for high angular resolution measurements, which means uh, getting very sharp uh, uh, knowledge on whatever you're studying. No? So, in our case, we need very bright and small objects and because nature is this way, <laughs> the thing that is very bright and very small are the stars that are far, far away. No? They are really, really tiny. So the, the, the uh, rule of thumb that we always use is the size of the closest stars, meaning the ones that you look at the sky and you see the stars with your bare eyes. Um, you can imagine a two euro coin uh, in the Eiffel Tower, for example, if you go to New York and you look at that coin, mm -hmm. that is the equivalent size of a star. Okay, so it's really, really tiny. Okay, mm -hmm. it's something very, very, very small to measure. No, um, and that's why when you think of these super famous optical telescopes like the James Webb Telescope, the Hubble uh, Space Telescope, all these telescopes are not able to measure the size of stars. They mm -hmm. just see them as points. Yeah. They are able to do amazing science, of course, yeah. but not, they are not as sharp as needed for. That's why you need interferometers, mm -hmm. these crazy <laughs> complex <laughs> telescopes, to do such a fine uh, and sensitive uh, uh, measurements to, to, to the size of these stars. No? This is the main science target. So science, scientific things that we can do by doing a stellar intensity interferometry or a stellar uh, interferometry. For example, um, Gaia, the Gaia 
satellite that maybe some of you have heard of has uh, measured the, the distance of thousands of millions of stars, okay? Mm -hmm. So it's mind-blowing. But the amount of stars that we know directly, like, like we have actually measured how large they are, so for example, we can measure how large the sun is, right? Like literally looking at it, we can. Yeah. But any other star can we? With our eyes, certainly not. Yeah. And the amount of stars that we have directly measured is roughly a thousand. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's literally one million difference yeah. <laughs> in order of magnitude. Okay. So, yeah. so this this means that even if we have gone very far towards detecting many stars and yeah. knowing that they are there, actually being certain of their size, mm -hmm. which is something very boring, like, okay, just knowing how big is yeah. a star. But it is so hard to measure yeah. that there are just very few stars that have been directly measured. Yeah. So um, things that are more complex, for example, um, uh, uh, stars, when they rotate very fast, mm -hmm. they are not spheres anymore. They g become flatter. They are like a melon or something. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, start understanding how rotation affects their evolution mm -hmm. is something very important for, for, for especially for very massive stars. Yeah. And these very massive stars are the ones that later on explode and become black holes, and then those black holes create gravitational waves. It's, it's, it's an important topic. Yeah. Uh, and understanding, so, so actually t being able to take a picture and actually mm -hmm. seeing how melon <laughs> they yeah. are, yeah. it's something that, that very few telescopes can do. Uh, okay. only only a handful of them yeah yeah so these are the kind of things that we can do dreaming you could also dream <laughs> many things yeah uh, yeah uh, what I always <laughs> like to dream about is uh, being able to measure the um, the shadow of a exoplanet passing in front of mm -hmm. a star that is sexy that would, that be, would be beautiful yeah, yeah. because it's very hard to understand astrophysics yeah. but if you see an image of an exoplanet passing in front of a star, then yeah. it's, done. Yeah. it's done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty cool. That is beautiful. That would be nice. Yeah. I think it's pretty incredible that, I mean, I have the feeling that we know a lot about stars. There are many. You mentioned how many. And you get the feeling that astronomers, you know, over the years have accumulated a lot of knowledge about how stars work, like all the different types, how they evolve, all of that. But it's incredible that something as simple or basic as the actual size is something that is not known and yeah. I'm wondering because I mean they have s some ideas I guess right they work with sizes but it's just models that they use I exactly, guess exactly exactly so so of course what I'm saying is that they have not been directly measured mm -hmm. but there are ways to measure them indirectly mm -hmm. like with this complex technique like asteroseismology like like measuring the vibration modes within the stars there are ways in which you can actually infer the radius but this is super <laughs> even more complex to explain yeah. now no? but but uh, something as simple as like take a ruler and measure the size of this table like mm -hmm. directly measuring the size of this table is something that is really hard to do with stars yeah. Yeah. so it's like you say so we know there are spectral types of yeah. stars we know how they evolve by seeing how they move uh, over the years, of, uh, um, over the millions of years, yeah. in the in the Helmut Russell diagram. Um, uh, so there are ways to know what is their size, but we base that knowledge on models. Mm -hmm. And how do you fix those models with mm -hmm. direct observations? Yeah. So um, uh, it is actually crucial. For, for some time ago, actually, there were specific spectral types of stars that had never been directly measured. Mm -hmm. And right now, there are few spectral types that seem to have offsets with respect to models. Mm -hmm. So these are the kind of things that, yes, okay, we have a lot of knowledge on the stars, but there are clearly things that we don't fully understand. No? Yeah. So uh, things improve when you provide better measurements. Yeah. Right. So then that's a way also to yeah, test those models and yes. improve them. Yeah. That's what experimentalists like yeah. to think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that our work is useful. <laughs> Maybe a theorist will tell you, ah, you know, stars, they are this big, doesn't matter, plus minus three percent. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So, okay, maybe let's get into it. 
How yes. does it work? Cherenkov telescopes first and yes. then interferometry. Okay, let's do it. Yes. <laughs> so who explains what the Cherenkov telescopes are? We can do it together. Okay. <laughs> Good. So they are big. Yes. <laughs> yes. So the, the main difference between a Cherenkov telescope and a classical optical telescope is that classical optical telescopes directly measure the light of galaxies no? mm -hmm. and create a beautiful image. And what we do is indirectly measure the photons that are created in showers of particles generated when a gamma ray hits the atmosphere. They create a, a flash of blue light that lasts nanoseconds. Mm -hmm. This means that it's a millionth of a second, so it's really, 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 really brief. And because they are so brief, these, these, these flashes of light, uh, the whole telescope changes. Mm -hmm. This is more or less the, the, yeah. the, the long story short. So, so the camera is made of pixels that are crazy fast. The whole camera is running at frequencies that are crazy fast. <laughs> And, and we cannot use the, the, the cameras that we use <laughs> right here. Yeah. Unfortunately, we cannot use these cameras, yeah. so we need to use yeah. other technologies. And we do gamma ray science. Yeah, yeah. I always like to uh, this comparison of because our cameras they have a thousand pixels, which compared <laughs> with any cell phone like mobile cameras, nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, we take a million pictures a second. Yes. And we, we, we show images in, 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 our, in our, you know, meetings, workshops, and they are just the, the most horrible image that you can imagine. <laughs> and then you have these, these, these optical astronomers showing yeah. beautiful supernova while we show just a Gaussian. <laughs> yeah, there is extension there. It's just True. so depressing. Yeah, so it is depressing a bit, but it's yes. also, I mean, the technology that we use is impressive yes and and the fact that we are measuring photons with so crazy energy yeah it's also incredible too yeah. so it's yeah. it's fun in yeah. our own way yeah <laughs> harder to sell yeah. with beautiful images <laughs> yeah but but very nice yeah, yeah. so um, this is what cherenkov telescopes do yeah so cherenkov telescopes basically yeah so the they work very differently from optical telescopes because Basically, what we look at, what we in the end observe, is not the light from some galaxies or stars or whatever that is coming to us, but the light is created in our atmosphere by sh extended air showers, showers of billions of particles that are produced in the atmosphere by these high energy particles that are hitting the atmosphere from whatever galaxy we are observing. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So that's the main difference. But these a constraint of measuring something that lasts for a few nanoseconds imposes that our telescopes need to be super big, like the magic telescopes are 17 meters in diameter, and there are two of them because we like to take photos simultaneously of the same shower. Yeah. And that's how we can properly reconstruct where the gamma ray was coming from, uh, identify it as a gamma ray and not as, uh, as a cosmic ray, etc. No? Yeah. So, this technology, these Cherenkov telescopes, come in arrays, in, in multiple telescopes. They are very large and they have cameras that are extremely fast. Mm -hmm. And these three technical aspects of Cherenkov telescopes are exactly why <laughs> they are interesting for interferometry. So, so it's like um, uh, uh, um, pure serendipity here, like, like in the in the in the 60s mm -hmm. there was a, a, an experiment called the Narabri stellar intensity interferometer that was the first interferometer ever done like not even radio antennas were working at the time no and these people were pushing for creating a pair of telescopes they they created a 6 di 6 meter diameter telescopes no two mm -hmm. two of them in rails they were like in a train no and, okay. and they you, they could move mm -hmm. uh, the, the telescopes and what they wanted to show is that by measuring the two signals from the star, they would measure a correlation. So, so some of the photons coming from the star would come exactly at the same time in the two telescopes, exactly with the same frequency. Mm -hmm. And the number of those correlated photons 
uh, would have information on the actual size of the star. No? So, so something that is really hard to understand and we would need to get into quantum uh, 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 physics that I don't know about, <laughs> so let's not get there. But the point here is that during a time in which quantum physics was being doubted, yeah. <laughs> there were some people that wanted to make a me direct measurement of a stellar diameters mm -hmm. using quantum properties of light, no? yeah. which was crazy. And they were able to measure the diameter of 32 stars that are still, nowadays, after 60-70 years, the, the best diameters available for those stars. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so yeah. so intelligent people back there yeah. the, uh, created this technology already. Yeah. No? And the funny thing is that these telescopes, these Narrabri Stellar Intensity Interferometers, they were very large. Yeah. They needed a, 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 a photo detector super fast to measure this variability in both telescopes. And they needed multiple telescopes to actually uh, change the di their distance, etc. Mm -hmm. So it's just serendipitously, <laughs> a, a very high energy sharing of telescopes require exactly the same thing as intensity interferometers, which is funny. No? Yeah. And the technique, like 60 years ago, was abandoned essentially because it needed cameras that were too fast mm. for the time, yeah. mirror areas that were crazy big, they mm. were too big for them no? to, to handle at yeah. reasonable costs. Uh, and also, uh, the more telescopes, the better, but it's very expensive to build yeah. many telescopes. Yeah. No? Uh, but yeah, so now, <laughs> now. <laughs> we Cherenkov people are doing exactly that. No? Yeah. And, and the next generation of Cherenkov telescopes is coming now, the Cherenkov telescope array, which will be made up of like, I don't know, 100 telescopes distributed over very large distances. Yeah. And yeah, mm -hmm. there were some people within within CTA, some some experts in intensity interferometry that were like, wait a minute, yeah. if you give me that telescope, <laughs> we modify this and this and these tiny pieces. I promise you, they are really tiny pieces. Uh, you modify them, you, we can do this other thing, you know? yeah. uh, which they are very far in terms of science, but technically it's easy. Yeah, it's easy. It's pretty cool. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So cool. okay. So the so kind of my question was also like, why are we only starting to do this now? Yeah. Yeah. So so it's 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 very easy to answer. So for a given amount of money, <laughs> <laughs> it's easier and you will get better sensitivity if you go to this other path of 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 uh, optical interferometry. This what is generally called uh, uh, well optical interferometry, because all optical interferometers right now use this amplitude interferometry, uh, like the Keck telescope, the Chara telescope, BLTI telescopes, or major telescopes ha that are operating as an interferometer right now. Mm -hmm. uh, they have these, these um, uh, they use this, they, they gather light from stars, mm -hmm. and they physically take that light, pipe it through some tubes, combine physically the, 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 the photons, no? Yeah. And then they measure physically, they make a photo of the interference pattern. Yeah. Like, that is super complex to do. Mm -hmm. Like, they need to control the path of every single photon mm -hmm. down to nanosecond, sorry, da down to nanometer scales. Like, it's, it's crazy that they are able to do it, no? Yeah. Uh, but, but, uh, if you, uh, you, for example, create a couple of small telescopes, like one meter telescopes, mm -hmm. no? uh, uh, and then you do this, you have better sensitivity than if you have like these six meter telescopes doing this intensity interferometry, because they are different techniques okay. and, and directly combining the, the photons provides better sensitivity. It is, it is the, the nature of the technique itself. Okay. No? Um, the key aspect here is that it is so expensive to build, uh, to, to control the path of the photons uh -huh. to nanometers, that if you decide to do this with telescopes that are way, way bigger, it starts getting more and more and more expensive. No? And, and amplitude interferometers are now reaching like a, like a um, limit okay. no? in terms of uh, distance between telescopes. So mm -hmm. the longer the distance is, the more complicated it is 
to have a hold on on, on, on how precise yeah. each photon uh, is moving. Um, uh, while for us, for this other technique, this intensive interferometry, doesn't matter. Just put wherever you want the telescopes, as long as you give me just a couple of cables connecting them, it's okay. more or less possible okay. to, to, to correlate. But the, the distance between telescopes also is like improving the sensitivity. Right? Yes, so, so. so uh, if we, so we can think about radio telescopes now, mm -hmm. no? so um, uh, when we think of radio telescopes, we think of these multiple antennas that, that create beautiful images of, of, of AGN, of, of uh, the Galactic Center. The, uh, radio telescopes are amazing nowadays. Yeah. Um, I, did, uh, I did an episode about the Event Horizon telescope. Yeah, so exactly, of course. If you yes. have listened to this, you should know what we're yes. talking so about. <laughs> the Event Horizon telescope was able to, to measure the, sh the shadow of a black hole but essentially, they are limited by the size of the Earth. They can transform the whole Earth yeah. as a telescope. And the bigger your telescope is, the smaller it is the things that you can study. Yeah. For instance, the, 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 the black hole of these, uh, sorry, the shadow of these black holes is the smallest thing that we have ever made a photo of. No? Uh, yeah. It's really absolutely tiny. No? Um, it's a factor. 20 smaller than what I said before. It's a factor 20 of this coin in Paris seen from New York. Yeah. A factor 20 smaller. Yeah. Um, if you wanted to do that in the optical, you can. Mm -hmm. But it would be so expensive to put telescopes separated by five kilometers yeah. and control the optical path so well yeah, yeah. To, to be able to combine them, etc. It would be expensive. No, possible, yeah. but expensive. Uh, while using this other technique, the mm -hmm. one that we are testing with the magic telescopes, it is way simpler, technically. No? Mm -hmm. So um, this is the reason why now we are starting to push for it. Yeah. Because in one hand we have telescopes that are able to do it, so, so why not doing it? Uh, also it's nice that we can perform these measurements over bright moon periods, mm -hmm. in which our telescopes they are essentially not, not operating, therefore we are getting science out of these telescopes for free yeah and and in addition thinking about the future if we are going to have 20 telescopes in the northern hemisphere with this cta northern observatory array uh, and like a hundred in, in in the south or there are not that many <laughs> so if in the end it will we'll be 50. <laughs> we'll see but yeah so so having so many telescopes uh, uh, the prospects are amazing like, yeah like um yeah, there is this other limitation that I have been, not been talking about, that, about the number of telescopes. Mm -hmm. It's not only uh, how sensitive you are, etc., it's the, um, how well you can reconstruct the image. No? Mm -hmm. So um, in radio, they build, build radio telescopes with so many antennas, be because the more antennas you have, the more information you have of, of the, the morphology of the image. No? If you have just a couple of telescopes, you can say, if a circle is this big or this big, even mm -hmm. if it's like a crazy supernova remnant, no? So, yeah. so you can only get like a, like a little bit of information mm -hmm. out of it. But if you start putting more and more and more telescopes, you start getting much more information at different scales, no? So, yeah. so you may, from my face, for mm -hmm. example, with two telescopes, you could see maybe how, how large my head is, no? Yeah. While if you start adding more telescopes, maybe you can see a shadow in my eyes. Maybe mm -hmm. here there is something. Maybe there is a nose, no? Yeah. And if you added like like hundred telescopes, then maybe you could get an image very very similar yeah. to my face, no? Yeah. Th that is exactly what we are planning to do, no? Um, using the classical optical interferometry that I was talking about, the one that we use nowadays, it is really hard to go beyond three, four telescopes. Yeah. Really hard. While for, for, for us, the intensity interferometry that now it's kind of reviving, give me a hundred telescopes, that's a matter. I, I, I can handle that okay. easily. No? Yeah. So that's, that's uh, uh, why lately it is starting to attract a bit of attention, mm -hmm. also funding, also it's, it's a very lively uh, moment to be right now yeah. if, if you ever worked in intensity interferometry it's a yeah. fun time now yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah sounds like yeah. it okay so so why how is intensity interferometry different from the amplitude interferometry yeah so so 
the way in which you so interferometers measure coherence let's let's this this crazy complex thing to do no so so depending on how separated your telescopes are when they are looking at a star mm -hmm. uh, the coherence changes no and studying how it changes when when you separate the telescopes i am able to reconstruct your face let's just imagine that no so the key aspect here is how i measure coherence for what different exactly do you mean by like what exactly is coherence it's a very a very complicated <laughs> thing to s explain no it's just a, a light on its way from your face to my telescopes mm -hmm. um, uh, organizes itself in a way that allows me to, to, to see correlations between different telescopes. So even if it's weird to think about it, two telescopes um, uh, looking at the same star, even if they are separated, there are uh, properties shared by the photons being independent different photons being mm -hmm. detected by different telescopes have things in common and those little things in common is what we measure it's super hard to explain yeah it's really quantum physics okay but the key key aspect here is that how we measure that coherence that is super hard to understand <laughs> how we measure it is dramatically different in, okay. in one in one method and the other no so in one method you simply uh, um, correlate signals and then you see a tiny correlated signal uh, between different telescopes uh, this means that what I was saying before so all photons are coming randomly in time but sometimes a single photon comes si exactly simultaneously between two telescopes and then another photon comes exactly simultaneously between other telescopes but for example if these two telescopes one I put it there that does not happen anymore Okay. Why? Quantum physics. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but in the end, if you simplify things, if you just say, okay, there is something that I want to measure, mm -hmm. I know it changes depending on the distance between my telescopes. Okay. No? Just let's simplify it. Okay. Then I tell you that if we measure that, we can create an image of, of a star. Then it's not that, that okay. complicated, right? <laughs> okay. So then the key aspect here is that the optical amplitude interferometers make an actual photo of this coherence and it's way better mm -hmm. we don't we cannot do that no we need to gather enormous amounts of photons to actually be able to identify how many are correlated etc so our signal is much worse in the sense that we need bigger telescopes no? but if we have those bigger telescopes no then um, maybe we can have 20 telescopes simultaneously measuring the correlations between each telescope with the others so that that is a uh, exponential no so the more telescopes you have have you have exponentially more combinations of telescope pairs right mm -hmm. and uh, that is what gives you a lot of information on the on the shape of of what you are measuring right so um right now we are not competing against this other technique. Yeah. It's not a competition. It's that for those bright sources in the sky, we may be able to study way more complex things than them mm -hmm. because they have less telescopes, but they will be able to study um, way fainter objects. Okay. Like, for instance, what they have been doing right now um, uh, in the in the in the galactic center they have been measuring the how stars are moving mm -hmm. and they were able to determine uh, uh, the the mass of the uh, yeah. supermassive black hole yeah. in the center of yeah. our galaxy essentially because they were able to to track how stars were moving yeah. super far away with a crazy resolution and th that's thanks to interferometers yeah um we would never be able to do that it's way, way, way too faint for us. Okay. But if there is a star nearby mm -hmm. that an exoplanet is passing in front of it, they won't be able to have enough resolution to be able to, to identify that tiny mm, shadow passing in front of it. But maybe we could. Maybe. Okay. That's essentially... So, so we are not in competition at all. It's, yeah. it's just different, different topics. Okay. But I think I still like haven't really understood 
Mm. I can understand that. <laughs> Certainly. Um, so you were saying you have these uh, photons, whatever, they come with this information that we don't understand <laughs> because it's quantum physics. And you correlate th these, this information between mm -hmm. two telescopes. Yes. So it's like two different photos coming, hitting two telescopes, but they have, they share this common exactly. thing. Exactly, yes. So we can correlate them. Mm -hmm. And But then you were saying something about, okay, if I move my telescope further away, then this correlation doesn't happen anymore. Yes, unless... If, if you s so, depending on how that correlation changes, you can say how big is the star, for example. Okay, so what, for example, like wh how, how is the signal or like how does this, this look different for a smaller star compared to a large star? Super, super easy. <laughs> so, you have two telescopes here. You yeah. see seven, a correlation of seven. Okay. If you separate them and you still see a correlation of seven, it probably means that the star is super small. If you take it even further and you see a correlation of seven, it means that the star is crazy small. No? While if you have two telescopes and you see seven, three, zero, then you know that it is whatever diameter. No? Okay. So this is precisely the problem that right now we have with magic. With magic, we are using the magic telescopes, we modify the magic telescopes just a tiny bit so that we can perform these measurements and what we see is that the two magic telescopes have a distance between them of 80 meters no? mm -hmm. so when we look at the stars of this size that i was talking about this this it's called one milli arc seconds it's it's a very small unit no that accounts for what i was talking about of the two euro coin so when we measure stars that are too small what we see is that <laughs> doesn't matter that we are at 80 meters we would need telescopes farther away, but as we cannot move our telescopes, unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, we are limited by, by the, the okay. distance. Yeah, yeah, right. So b because the larger the distance, the better your angular resolution is going to be. Exactly. So this distance puts the limit on the smallest size that you can resolve. Exactly. Okay. So then, okay. But radio telescopes do exactly what I'm explaining. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Radio telescopes do the same. The problem is that they have so much information, so much information. So the the complex thing to understand is really what what radio telescopes do because they work in complex numbers not mm -hmm. in real numbers yeah no? so talking <laughs> about complex numbers is complex <laughs> and and is even more difficult to explain so so just let me say that that all interferometers work more or less the same way yeah. there are key differences of course uh, um, but what we do is essentially that no it's creating this very weird measurement of something that is very hard to understand, but depending on how that weird measurement changes as a function of the distance between your telescopes uh, uh, is what gives you the information. No? Uh, that's why now we want to add more telescopes mm -hmm. to, the, to the magic telescopes yeah. in order to ha have more and more information mm -hmm. on the, the shape of the stars. That's okay. essentially it. Okay. So wait, and what is then again the, the intensity like hmm. in this interferometry? Yes, so uh, the intensity interferometry is called that way because what we measure instead of combining the optical beams, what we measure is the intensity, so the, the flux of, the, of light, of uh -huh. the star, but very fast. No? So what we are correlating is intensity, just intensity, while for Optical interferometers, what they combine is the phase of light. No, so so light is not uh, particles; they are they are, they are waves. No, well, they are both. But both. <laughs> both. <laughs> so uh, when you combine them, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, photons that have this phase and photons that have this phase cancel each other out. Yeah. Then they create this pattern. Yes. No? So then they are gaining from the information that not only amplitude but also phase gives them. Yeah. In our case, we cannot work with phases. The only thing that we can work with is intensity. Is we see a signal, a signal, just number of photons arriving to our photodetectors. It's not nothing. And, and, and from time to time, there are these correlations happening. No? Mm -hmm. uh, so this is intensity as a function of time. It's really easy to understand. You are looking to a star, seeing how the intensity is changing as a function of time. And then there is this tiny correlation between the two signals, no? And 
and uh, that is why it's called intensity interferometry. There is a tiny correlation between the intensities as a function of time of the different telescopes mm -hmm. that you can do interferometry with. Okay. Yes. Okay. So how big are these fluctuations? Oh, they are absolutely tiny. Like <laughs> when we measure, uh, when we measure it, it's a measurement uh, of something to the power of minus six. So, so it means that <laughs> it is a millionth of whatever you're measuring. <laughs> so, okay. so that's why we need so many photons, mm -hmm. such big telescopes, because if you don't have a small telescopes, the number of photons that you will be getting is so tiny that maybe you're expecting zero number of correlated photons between different telescopes. Mm -hmm. If you don't detect a single correlated photon, it's impossible to, to do anything. Okay. No? You need very large telescopes for this technique. No? Yeah. Uh, and that's why we use sharing of telescopes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I apologize. This is super complicated no. to understand. No, I mean, yes, but you're doing a good job in explaining <laughs> it. You're doing a I'm good trying. Job. I promise I'm, I'm trying. <laughs> I'm doing my best. <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely getting there for sure now. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so you talked about you want to add more telescopes. Mm -hmm. So yes. what's what's next for the future? Yes, so so the first telescope that we have built coming from this next generation of telescopes uh, uh, that is right now installed right next to the magic telescopes is the LST-1 prototype that you know a lot about. <laughs> I do, but the <laughs> listeners don't. <laughs> yes. So magic telescopes are 17 meters in diameter. Okay, they are they are large telescopes, but then <laughs> they look the, like the small brothers <laughs> of of the the first prototype of CTA, which is the large sized telescope LST, um, the first prototype, which is 23 meters in diameter. It's enormous. No? Um, also the camera it's better than the preview that the, than the magic telescopes the, the 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 pixels are are better they are they they detect more photons etc and so so there are many reasons why if we add this new telescope to the system of the two magic telescopes mm -hmm. uh, uh, the improvement would would be dramatic no uh, uh, we would really really become much better no? but the thing is that that uh, uh, another three of these telescopes are coming. No? Mm -hmm. so, so, so in the next, let's say, five years, uh, uh, three additional of these large size telescopes uh, are being built. Yeah. This means that we will have a system of enormous telescopes uh, at different distances, that that is what, what, <laughs> what interferometers want, no? yeah. um, all being able to be correlated among each other, which is uh, uh, something that is not common for optical interferometry, no? mm -hmm. uh, and that is very exciting. No? So, so the amount of science that you can do right now with the two magics is, yeah, that that star looks this big, and that one looks this big. Mm -hmm. Maybe that one looks a bit like a melon. That's essentially it, because the, the number of targets that you can really target is the ones that you see with your eyes mm -hmm. in big cities, like the ones that are really, really bright. Okay. Okay. Yes. But if you start adding enormous telescopes like the LSTs, then you can go to much uh, fainter stars, mm -hmm. you can do way more science, you can even create images of these stars. It's, it's something that is going to be very exciting to do. Okay. Yes. And, and the first measurements may come relatively soon, so, so that's why we are getting excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 that, that yeah. will be fun to do. Also something that is important for us. This is a science case that have not been uh, essentially blessed by CTA. No? CTA's objective is very high energy astronomy, mm -hmm. right? So what, what we also want to do is to show that the changes in the telescopes are so minimal. What are the changes? Okay, um, <laughs> so the changes are just for one pixel, for me to be able to gather the signal that that pixel is measuring out of the camera. No? So Cherenkov telescopes are generally prepared to trigger, what we call trigger, to, to when there is a... You can th think of, of uh, uh, in, a, in a storm, 
mm-hmm. thunder, no? Yeah. How do people make photos to those thunders, no? Uh, what they do is they, they have a camera prepared. When something bright comes, they, they create a photo, no? The lightning, you mean, not the thunder. Jesus. <laughs> I'm a Spanish man. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yes, okay. lightning. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so when the when the uh, chain of telescope do something very similar, no, they are waiting for something bright to happen like this in nanosecond times. Yeah. And when that ta- that thing happens, then we make a photo. No? Yeah. So we are, it's not like we are measuring like each nanosecond making photos. Yeah. It would be impossible to gather such enormous amount of data. No? But what I need is actually that crazy amount of data from a single pixel, not from the whole camera, mm-hmm. from a single pixel and to take it out of the camera. No? Mm-hmm. With that, I can live. It's yeah. really just a very tiny uh, uh, thing. So at Thimat, we have experts in the electronics and in the camera that were able to identify the tiny changes that you need to do in order to extract this signal. Mm-hmm. As soon as you extract the signal, the only complicated thing to do is to calculate this correlation that I was explaining. And for that, we need a big machine yeah. <laughs> that is able to do that efficiently. And uh, we al- already got funding for, for building this crazy machine. So we are going to spend a shitload of money <laughs> on building that machine. Then also on applying those small changes in the camera, we will convince the LST collaboration and also, I hope, <laughs> CTA collaboration yeah. to actually explain them that the change is so minimal mm-hmm. and also we can perform observations when CTA is just not observing uh, not observing yeah so so why not yeah that's I think one of the most sexy things about stellar interferometry that like because with gamma ray observations we cannot do them during bright moon periods exactly so yeah. for a couple of nights a month our telescopes are just standing still and not doing anything and yeah those are exactly the nights that you can use yeah so I would justify I would justify that to me, there are even sexier things that would justify observing also in, 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 in dark observations. Yeah. No? But come on, like we are getting science out for free yeah. during the time that you will be doing nothing. So Exactly. You're not stealing yeah. anything exactly, from anyone exactly. for exactly. like the original purpose. We are of not the competing array. with anyone. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's like no one will be like, okay, you're stealing time from me because yeah, exactly. you're not using time. There is no competition, is it's just yeah. cooperation. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah, there are these key aspects of intensity interferometry that are very synergic with, with, with Cherenkov telescopes, no? and it's just a shame that we don't exploit it. No? So, yeah. So, yeah. so, there are other projects. Actually, mm-hmm. instead of using Cherenkov telescopes, going to classical optical telescopes, like the big ones, the, yeah. the, like the Grand Tecan that we have in the Canary Islands, but also thinking about the extremely large telescope and this enormous telescope that are being uh, mm-hmm. built right now. And perhaps you could do in- intensity interferometry to correlate telescopes that are 10 kilometers away. Mm-hmm. And okay. then that could allow you to, to measure some crazy things yeah. with better resolution than the Event Horizon Telescope. No? Mm-hmm. That's why it, it is exciting because perhaps we can measure the, the uh, um, how matter is falling within a black hole here in the galaxy, no? yeah. uh, or how how um, the surface of a of a of a um, white dwarf is exploding during a nova and mm-hmm. things like that. No? Yeah. Um, so yeah, there are very interesting things that perhaps developing this technique further can can trigger. No? So yeah. yeah, so it's it's a very early phase mm-hmm. of this of this uh, revival of this technique yeah but yeah it's it's progressing smoothly i would yeah. say <laughs> it's looking good yeah, yeah it's good that you you got the shitload of money <laughs> to yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah actually uh, r- just last week or a couple of weeks ago there was another big grant in switzerland also focused on intensity interferometry with our collaborators from geneva in 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 and, and other institutes in in, in switzerland uh, also collaborating with us in magic. So it's like several groups working in intensity interferometry are already starting to get like big chunks of money. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and when funding agencies put money on something, it means that it's probably interesting yeah. enough to yeah. attract that, yeah, yeah. that amount of money. So yeah, yeah. 
looking things good. are moving looking good yes yeah. yes 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 i'm i'm happy yeah. <laughs> yes yes i'm excited ask me five years from now maybe i will be super <laughs> depressed but right now i'm super happy yeah no it's good you look <laughs> yeah, happy yeah, 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 yes, yes, yes. yeah it's an exciting exciting time yeah yeah, yeah i hope that this. i hope that soon i will have more fun things to show yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah yes okay well i think this has been a really great conversation you did a good job in explaining it i did it. all i could yes i promise yeah <laughs> i suffered <laughs> no, no i mean I it's really, a difficult it's a difficult it's topic. difficult but i got definitely closer to understanding what you what it is you're doing and i will recommend it to everyone in our collaboration because maybe they were awesome. yes we need analysis <laughs> we need people publishing papers yeah. <laughs> Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. well, thank you so much. Thank you for inviting <laughs> me. Ciao, ciao. That's it. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and if you like this podcast, please hit subscribe. If you would like to know more about Tarek and his research or the magic telescopes, visit their website or social media channels. You can find all the links in our show notes. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter or LinkedIn and don't hesitate to contact us for any questions, feedback or suggestions. Offspring Magazine, the podcast, is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD Net and the science communication working group known as the Offspring Magazine. The intro-outro music is composed by Srinath Rangkumar and the pre-intro jingle is composed by Gustavo Corizzo. For any feedback, comments or suggestions, please feel free to write us at offspringplotpodcast at phdnet.mpg.de. Until next week, stay safe, stay healthy. Bye-bye.